مش بكنكا Do you want to get started now? Yes. Perfect. Well, hello and good afternoon or evening or morning, depending on where you live. My name is Corey Peterson, and I serve as the president of the International Town Gown Association. We have over 160 city and university staff registered to attend today's conversation, and they're registered from all around the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom, and participating in today's webinar titled Effective Approaches for Addressing Housing Uncertainty in College Towns. I'm joined today by three colleagues, each who will provide background and share stories of success addressing housing uncertainty in their current or former roles. And our hope today is that many of you will have an aha or breakthrough idea as a result of today's conversation. Our time together is scheduled for 75 minutes. We hope to keep the presentation part of the webinar to 45 to 50 minutes to allow plenty of time for questions and conversation. As we move throughout today's session, please use the Q&A function in the webinar, and I'll do my best to ensure the panelists address your questions at, in real time if possible. Lastly, today's webinar will be recorded and shared later on on the ITGA website at itga.org. So be sure to check it out there if you need it to go back for a second look. With that introduction, let's start with introductions of our panelists. And after they introduce themselves, we'll then start with the formal presentation. So we'll start with Jeanette from DLR Group. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeanette Walton. I'm uh, an architect and principal with DLR Group located in our San Francisco office. So I'm in the morning section of the day. <laughs> um, I've been working in both multifamily residential and higher education for almost 18 years. Um, I'm very passionate about design and uh, the way that it can be used to solve big topics like the one we're discussing today. So I'm very excited to have this conversation. Fantastic. And Dr. Ken Brown? Uh, my name is Ken Brown. I'm formerly the Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operations Officer for the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. We've got six professional colleges at the um, at the Health Science Center, and so our student population is not the uh, traditional undergraduate population that um, many of you find yourselves challenged with. So our situation was a, a little bit unique. Awesome. And Dr. Steve Patterson. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're at. Uh, Steve Patterson, mayor of Athens, Ohio, stroke full-time mayor. Uh, and Athens is the home to Ohio University where I used to be a faculty member. So I know full well the challenges that most of us are experiencing with affordable housing or housing stock period. Uh, and I'm also the current past president for the International Town Gown Association. Awesome. And not on our panelists, but our executive director, Beth Bagwell from ITGA is also joining us here. So you'll notice Beth on the screen. You want to say hi, Beth? Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. We're so excited to have to have this robust conversation today. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and start to share my screen. Um, if I could ask one of the panelists to give me a thumbs up to make sure that is coming through loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we will start with um, Jeanette. I think you're up first. And just let me know when you'd like to advance the next slide. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Corey. I've really been looking forward to this conversation about uh, what is a very big topic. And I really appreciate the desire for a solution focused conversation. Um, sometimes it's really easy to get lost in the problem, especially uh, a problem of this magnitude. Um, my experience as an architect working in mixed use and multifamily housing throughout California and particularly in the Bay Area means that I do have a lot of experience with challenges that lead to housing scarcity, um, things like zoning limitations, construction costs, uh, lack of neighborhood support. Um, but in trying to think specifically about solutions that are either focused on serving local institutions or have similarities that make them worth discussing, um, two themes really started to emerge for me. The first being uh, design solutions, which, of course, as an architect, I can't help but think that just about everything falls into this category. Um, but really what we're talking about is this idea of understanding trends and how things are changing. Um, coming to terms with the fact that there's not going to be a silver bullet solution for all these projects, that each project is going to be unique. And so our approach really wants to be looking for 
opportunities to innovate and to build trust within teams so that we can really start to move that needle. Um, and then the second theme was looking beyond those design solutions. Um, we're going to be looking a little bit later at some case studies and there will be some examples of how uh, policy has really made a difference. And, you know, if those policies are not available to you currently, um, potentially we're planting some seeds for uh, opportunities around advocacy. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so let's get into some very high level trends or design considerations. Uh, this first one is really focused on the resident and this idea of providing a diversity of choice. Um, I think we're all pretty familiar with one of the key factors in both attracting and retaining students is access to housing that appeals not only to the student, but also to parents. Um, and finding the right design solutions that can meet the needs of a first year student, for example, is going to look different than the right solution for a graduate student with a family. Uh, so how do we design in that choice and flexibility to be able to meet those diverse needs? Um, diversity of choice can also help to start addressing some issues around affordability. Um, one of the conversations that's been coming up a lot is the desire for privacy. Um, students today are less likely to have shared bedrooms growing up. And so, uh, so they're looking for opportunities in single occupancy housing arrangements. And so being able to provide some options within that realm um, can allow them to weigh some of those benefits against cost in order to find uh, the right price point for them. Next slide. Now looking a little bit more at the physical context, um, this idea of designing for the place, this is kind of circling back to that idea that what we're really looking to do is to design uniquely suited solutions um, asking questions about how are we integrating into an existing neighborhood or campus community and looking at things um, like triple bottom line sustainability, which is really looking at uh, environment, economy, and equity. Um, trends are very clearly telling us that students care a lot about the impact that we're having on the physical environment. So our designs need to be able to address those concerns directly. Projects obviously need to be uh, economically feasible and sustainable. And then getting to the heart of some of the underlying roots of housing scarcity, really asking questions about how we are providing equity in these living environments. Next slide. Looking at the idea of creating connections and uh, in this context, I'm not necessarily referring to the place, but more about connecting to people in the community. Um, I really love this topic. I think that there's a lot of potential for innovation and fun uh, in looking beyond just the residential programming, ideas around placemaking. Um, you can look at uh, successful mixed use or hospitality developments as uh, good examples. Um, there's also an approach to amenities and services where we can have an eye for doing more than just supporting students, um, but really being a broader asset to the community. Examples could be if we have a gym, for example, um, are we offering memberships to the community in order to welcome them in? Or uh, a maker space potentially gives uh, opportunity to foster connections to industry. Um, these are just some considerations that can really start to bridge community concerns as well and uh, help to start to earn some community support for the development. Next slide. And to round out kind of this high level overview, coming back to that idea of going beyond the design solutions, um, I found it really interesting to look at the roster for today's webinar. Um, it's really clear that housing scarcity in college towns uh, is not a local problem. It's affecting a broad range of institutions all over the country. Um, so having tools at potentially the state or even the national level could be a really effective way to start to address this. Um, but locally, the topic of community engagement is really important and something that I'm sure we could have an entire uh, separate webinar about. Um, but re one resource that I found interesting, um, looking at the California Statewide Housing Plan website, uh, they have a framework called Tiers, and it's for public engagement at the local level. And one of the things that I always come back to in regard to this goal of finding support for development is that we're potentially 
uh, creating a kind of approach that starts to engage the community around these broader goals and values in the development so that they're already invested in the solution before we start talking to them about a specific project. So that was uh, kind of a high level overview of some trends and things to be considering um, as we start to get into a little bit more depth in, uh, in this panel discussion. So I'll hand it back to you, Corey. Fantastic, thanks for getting us started on that. And um, we're gonna move on to Dr. Brown, but if folks have questions, please remember to use the Q&A feature um, as we move through this. We're gonna come back to Jeanette. She's got some case studies and some further solutions that she's seen be effective in some various communities. So we'll come back to her in a little bit, but we're gonna move on to Dr. Brown. Thanks, Corey. And my, our story at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center is, is really a, a story more about um, resiliency and the, the all of the challenges that you potentially face. You know, had I known um, Jeanette and had I known Steve before um, I started this project many, many years ago, my life would have been so much easier. So I certainly encourage uh, the audience to rely upon them and the, the, the benefit of their wisdom because many of the challenges that I faced were around the things that uh, Jeanette talked about and some of the things that Steve will talk about. So our story began, um, you know, almost 25 years ago when I first came to the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. They had traditional dormitories. And as you all know very well by now, traditional dormitories for professional students is a uh, a virtual non-starter. Our students have all gone to undergrad institutions, some of the finest institutions in the country, um, successfully matriculated and now embarking on professional school, either as medical students, dental students, pharmacy students, uh, PhD, basic science research students, and or um, in the allied health professions. So by the time they come to us, they're certainly not even remotely considering living in a uh, in a dormitory situation, and that's what the University of Tennessee had some 25 years ago. Uh, the fact that we had virtually no occupancy sent a clear and resounding message that that did not meet the needs of our students. And as Jeanette mentioned, figuring out what the needs of the the students are is a very, very critical component. And for adult professional students, it really wasn't that hard of an exercise. They're a much different population than a 17 or 18 year old leaving home for the first time. Um, so there are lots of amenities in Memphis. Unfortunately, the university didn't have any um, in our geographical proximity. And dormitories in Tennessee are considered auxiliaries. And so that means that like parking garages, the revenue that you generate from the residency is what you have to use to fund those kinds of projects uh, because the state won't give you state resources to build it. And so knowing the financial challenges that we have, we thought we'd engage in a public private kind of endeavor. These were relatively new um, in Tennessee. And Corey, you can move to the next slide. Um, that just kind of gives you some relative proximity to where the professional school campus sits in Memphis compared to the other University of Tennessee uh, campuses across the state. And you can go to the next slide, Corey. Um, so the University of Tennessee Health Science Center is located in the, in the medical district in the heart of, uh, of, of Memphis. And so looking for a partnership um, in that geographical proximity, we concluded early on that we would probably have to use some of the university's land to be able to engage in, in such an endeavor. So we had about 10 acres and we went to a relatively prominent developer in the Memphis area, uh, Henry Turley Company, who's responsible for the building of Mud Island and a lot of other residential developments. And we kept talking to them about the the mutuality of the benefit of doing this. You know, it was an opportunity for a local developer to give back and support the community uh, by assisting the university in building out this residential capacity. The pathway of least resistance for us, you know, I didn't want to be um, in, in the housing business uh, per se. Uh, <clears throat> so we thought we would do a land lease with the developer and let him build and manage the the, the residential uh, units that he, he built. Um, 
of course, in Tennessee, everything has to be bid out. We went through this relatively protracted bid process. There were a number of developers up to and including the local developer that we really wanted that bid on the project, some of whom uh, specialize in just building dormitory housing across the country. So this uh, was a relatively protracted process and drug on for a couple of months, but we successfully navigated it and were able to enter into a, uh, I'll call it a joint venture for lack of a better descriptor with the developer. Our part was simply a land lease to them. They owned and bore the responsibility for building and managing the, the residential units for about 10 acres. Ultimately, the project will culminate in about 375 residential um, units. Um, as you could imagine, the project was not without challenges. As soon as we embarked on it, we start to do uh, land and soil analysis, figured out the 10 acres that were previously flat surface lot parking was uh, almost an EPA uh, Superfund toxic site. And so there had to be all kinds of soil remediation, <clears throat> much of which we didn't speak to in the contractual relationship. And so this was one of the, the first times that the university <clears throat> and the state re really had to uh, demonstrate a little bit of fluidity and latitude in terms of uh, coming to agreements to be able to work through things that were not quantified in the definitive terms of the contract. We were able to, to get past that and construction began on the development. Um, and now uh, it's pretty close to substantial completion. Corey, you can go to the next slide. Um, and you kind of see the, the footprint of the medical district campus there. Uh, that highlighted in blue is really the land lease that we did with the developer. And you can go to the next slide, Corey, that kind of shows Orlean Station. <clears throat> and one more. So this is where the housing development is on the, uh, on the west side of our, our campus. Um, in addition to the housing units that really with a private developer encompassed all the things that Jeanette kind of outlined. You know, there were times we were in discussion with the city, again, with the city mayor and the county mayor, uh, again, and Steve will speak to this a little bit, but what the, the success of our project really was, was in this creation of a win-win-win, if you will, you know, kind of project. <clears throat> About 20 years ago, there was this huge migration from downtown Memphis. This housing development was really one of the first uh, opportunities for that resurgence of people living down in the medical district. People don't wanna live, today's students and today's professional workforce don't wanna live in the suburbs with you know, two acres and a, and a picket fence. You know, they're more <clears throat> inclined to live in, uh, in some relative proximity close to where they matriculate as students and where they work as a, as professional employees in our, in our adjacent hospitals. And you can go to the next slide, Corey. And so this kind of just gives you an orientation of what Orleans Station has ultimately turned into. It's uh, become the nucleus of a, a relatively vibrant medical district. And as a result of increasing this residential capacity back in the medical district, we have about 16,000 square feet of, of retail space and there's all kinds of restaurants and other amenities that are starting to um, move into the, the medical district proper adjacent to um, downtown. And so the, the only thing that I think that's remarkable about our story and the takeaway message for each and every one of you is that, you know, these kinds of projects are wrought with a multitude of challenges, but I think any institution um, within any community can find that partnership, local private developers uh, with the municipalities. Again, Steve will talk to you a little bit about that, but but our story uh, was was wrought with a multitude of challenges, and um, you know I think the the commitment and the support that we were able to align with, again, private developers and, and you know, local and state support uh, was ultimately what made this, you know, project successful. And so 
Um, I'd certainly welcome uh, questions from you all. I can speak to um, navigating the challenges, um, you know, more than anything else, because, you know, I think it'll go without saying that, um, you know, these kinds of endeavors are not easy, but certainly they're, they're manageable and they're doable. And so I, I think, you know, any institution out there that's looking for a project akin to this, um, you know, has the capacity to be successful in doing it. So I'll turn it back over to you, Corey. Well, thanks, Dr. Brown. I, I actually had one or two quick just follow-ups. You you talked about the challenges and the community engagement process that you that you had being a very transparent process. Did you did you have a template for that that you used from another institution, or was that something you developed with your your partner on that with the city? How well, did you go about approaching that community engagement process? What we did, we actually engaged uh, Jeanette's firm through our capital uh, project planning process. Um, and as a part of our uh, capital planning project, we laid out a five-year master plan for the university. We held public town halls. We held public forums. There were forums that were specifically targeted at developers uh, and other community organizations. There were lots of things directed at the municipality, both the city of Memphis proper and the county. So we did a lot of um, forecasting of what I, we thought our aspirational state would be and engage stakeholders much, much early on in the in the process, again, as a part of our capital master planning process. Awesome. And we have a couple of follow-ups here in the chat that came up. Um, did UT have to commit to a minimum number of units for occupancy and what was the financial risk? UT, uh, we were, um, un unfortunately, I'm, a, I'm an attorney, uh, I say unfortunately, but you know, we sat down with the developer and and to really look at what they wanted out of the thing. You know, the university, we really weren't in it for um, a financial gain. And so we were prepared to let the developer take all the risks and take all the revenue. You know, the land lease was relatively de minimis, you know, but our goal was getting housing for the benefit of not being in the housing business. So we really invested very little upfront other than, you know, help them remediate the site um, as a result of that, but the developer put up all the revenue and undertook all the risk. What we did get um, as a benefit was a reversion at the end of a, I believe, 50-year um, commercial lease of the land. Everything reverts back to the university. So the units and everything that's on the university property at the end of the 50-year lease reverts back to the university. And so the university actually in in my mind won out in this a we got the benefit of of university housing without the burden of owning it and maintaining it and doing the, all the other things it's in our geographical proximity we provide security for it wi-fi we've got our gym facilities that student residents are are certainly have the benefit of and um we have built some additional parking capacity so students can show up and park a vehicle and never have to use it for three or four months. Um, I, Susan's got a great follow-up here and it was something else. It was my second question I wanted. Out. It was around including an affordability component. Was there an inclusionary zoning or an inclusionary process uh, for you know students or non-university affiliated people to be able to lease there? Yeah, we did include that kind of a discussion in there. And what we wanted to do was make it, you know, financially attractive for students to stay there. So we looked for some, you know, marginal um, decline in the cost of adjacent residential capacity in the district. We did not ask the developer to reserve a set number of units for our students. And so, you know, every year we have a, a cadre of students come in, they've got the latitude to put their name on the waiting list a year out, you know, as they're applying for medical school or other professional colleges. And so uh, it's worked out. <clears throat> and again, we, we built a daycare and some adjacency and uh, also, set a rate on that for our employees and our students to make it attractive to be able to use that. So again, the developer gets the benefit of this captive, if you will, population 
uh, for a little bit of consideration for the benefit of, of the university. And that was one of the things that the state actually looked for um, in the contractual terms of the relationship. And so it was a little bit of give and take, but again, a local developer that was committed to uh, this project and the university. So it, it, it really worked out with a really, really fine balance. Well, I appreciate those answers. We do have a couple more in the chat and Dr. Brown, I'll, I'll connect with you through chat while we move on to Mayor Patterson and, and his part. Um, and, but we will have lots of time at the end, I promise. We, we've allotted some time at the end to be able to dig deeper and have more of these questions and answers, but I wanna make sure that we uh, move on to Mayor Patterson. Thanks, Corey. And you know, Dr. Brown, let me just say this real quick. I was a researcher at uh, UT Memphis back in 96 to 98. And looking at this image, just number one, I think it's amazing what has happened because in 1996, this didn't exist. Um, I remember that parking lot well. So sure. what an amazing improvement. I lived over on South Main uh, in that district within Memphis back in the day. Um, I'm going to kind of get a little bit into the, the weeds and certainly talk to a lot of the same issues that Dr. Brown has mentioned um, with the challenges that university communities face. Uh, but before I jump in, let me just paint a little bit of a picture for Athens and Ohio University. We're a city of about 30,000 population. Um, our footprint is about 11 square miles, give or take. Uh, as I mentioned, the home to Ohio University, where the my population is um, by and large the student population. And when you have that, a lot of our housing stock are rental units, um, which really made it challenging when I was faculty at Ohio University. I was typically that faculty member during job searches to drive potential faculty around the city and show them potential housing. Uh, it was always a challenge um, to show them where they could live. And so it's it's been an ongoing issue. Uh, in 1993, as you can see on this slide, the university acquired what used to be called, and not my favorite term at all, the Athens Lunatic Asylum. The, the, it was a state mental hospital sitting on a ridge overlooking the city of Athens, um, a beautiful building. Um, which sits on 700 acres of land. The building itself had has 544 rooms in it. Um, it's 700,000 square foot of space. And when the university acquired it, um, there really wasn't necessarily a plan as to what was going to be done with it. Um, it could potentially have served as a university use for expanded teaching facilities for um, uh, administrative offices, a number of things. but And some of that has happened, but I would say the vast majority of the structure, as well as the lands around it, um, have not um, been maintained or developed. And so relatively new here in the city of Athens was the establishment of what's called a new community authority. Uh, where we partnered with one of our local or regional local development districts, um, which is called Buckeye Hills Regional Council, uh, as well as a group called Community Building Partners to establish a, again, a new community authority. And Corey, if you would jump to the next slide. To give you kind of an idea as to how these work, um, it is something that falls within Ohio state law, um, they created this under the Ohio revised code as a way in which you can take properties that are state owned uh, as the university is um, and rethink how you go about developing that to, as you can see, it can be industrial, um, you jump back, industrial, commercial, residential, cultural, educational or recreational spaces and we really zeroed in on the residential and commercial with the ridges um, as we continue to plan what that can become. Uh, a lot of what um, Dr. Brown was saying, you know, the university has the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. So we too have professional schools to where um, those individuals who are in, in you know, graduate degree programs, 
professional programs um, don't want to you know, essentially live in student housing. Um, they would like to live somewhere that is more accustomed to what they will be migrating to once they get their degrees. And so we saw, again, a path with creating um, both equity, um, equity gaining properties, as well as some rental properties and commercial properties using this particular tool. Um, it required though, that there be a strong partnership between the local government, the city of Athens and Ohio University where we have really been, um, you know, thoughtful and purpose uh, with great purpose, knowing that we can only be stronger together as the university in the city. And so we've been very intentional of making this work. The, the new community authority is a part of that partnership between the university and the city, university knowing that they needed to figure out a way without um, a project of this size, as you can tell, is a $220 million project at the end of the day in terms of just the redevelopment to make condominium housing, to make uh, some rental units up there, to make some freestanding. Um, there was also concern because the 700 acres, a lot of it is used as, as um, a research laboratory for the university, for the, the botany department, um, for uh, plants and biology department, they, they have their own projects going on up there. And so we didn't want to lose the beautiful forested areas and research areas up there. So with the new community authority, we were able to draw it down to where it's going to be 100 acres or yeah, 100 acres of the Ridges property that will be up for redevelopment or new development. Uh, and then the remaining under, it will be under a nature conservancy. So there'll be a deed restriction on the remainder to where it stays open spaces, um, which will be wonderful. We can also add, you know, additional outdoor recreation and park areas to this development in the future. Um, some of the other things that are interesting with this, with having a new community authority, is that with the authority, which initially the board is set up with, city representation. Uh, my service safety director sits on it as well as a city council member. And then the university has appointed individuals. So it starts as kind of a, a pretty formal structure, um, which has the ability to um, self-select a developer to come in or developers in this case, because it'll be retail developers, commercial developers, um, housing developers, um, recreational space developers that will come together and and make this all work. So again, to, to not be held to um, having to go out through the bid process, the new, the new community authority can go in and say, okay, um, these individuals have shown a strong track record of being able to develop and we can self-select um, based upon um, their credentials, which we feel is the appropriate way to work as well. Uh, cities and university state properties cannot do that um, because of statute. Um, they can also issue bonds, which is important. This is no different than a port authority, um, you know, being able to do something like this. So um, that's something that's also being explored. Uh, it also allows us to pull some other levers, what I'm gonna, which I'm going to get to in just a minute with another project that is going on in the city, um, such as tax uh, increment financing. Uh, it also allows us to um, help with a capital stack for a developer to not have things like um, a capacity fee or tap fee for your water system yet, uh, because we know that there's going to be people living in them and that the, it's going to benefit the city, uh, especially since we are an income tax based city. That's where our general revenue comes from. Or if you want to flip to the next slide real quick. Uh, this is kind of giving you a bird's eye view down onto the footprint of the ridges um, to also further um, put an exclamation mark on the city university partnership. Everything that's in yellow, those are city properties. Um, a lot of it are, is parkland um, or, you know, uh, playground areas. Um, one of them up in the over on the left hand side of your screen is a baseball diamond and a miniature golf course that is city owned 
and operated, right? Uh, and then there's state lands, and then there's the university lands, which is primarily the, the Ridges Kirkbride building, the building that was in the previous slide. Um, and so what you see in the hash mark area is what has been requested from the city to basically deed into the new community authority for development for this project, which will be equity bearing housing projects um, in that hashed area. Uh, and then some other features. So the, the city has skin in the game, um, you know, a, in a true partnership way to make this work at the end of the day because of us knowing the need that we have for housing so that we can continue to grow. Uh, Corey, next slide. I want to kind of transition away from the new community authority and ex at least explain a way in which, again, we have been helping developers and in particular on green spaces, so undeveloped properties or areas where in this day and age for a developer to, to come in and try to build housing, affordable housing for your community. And if they have to put in the infrastructure, so water, sewer, storm, and the roadway itself, it likely is never going to pencil out because it, it just, for the price point that they're going to have to realize, it, it, uh, it, it becomes very challenging, uh, if not impossible. So using something that um, some of you may be familiar with, using tax increment financing or TIF financing, there is a way in which we are able to incentivize or help with the capital stack for a developer on a green space, undeveloped space, um, which is really uh, helpful for my community. Um, in particular, using what's called a non-traditional tax incremental financing or neighborhood revitalization, TIF, um, where there is a property tax 75% capture for a 10-year period of time. So if you have green space and now you're building houses on that green space, the valuation of that property clearly is going to go up significantly. That increase in property value the city is able to capture 75% of that increase for 10 years, and we can use that then to basically pay back to the developer for the roadway that they've built, the water, the sewer, the storm, um, and therefore it really helps them figure out, okay, now we can concentrate on keeping the price point for the houses lower so that, uh, and not have to worry about the infrastructure that's in place, or not in place, that has to be built up. There's also um, the, the, uh, what's called a traditional TIF, um, which are typically 100% capture for a 30-year period of time. The one thing that becomes challenging with these is that it is going to take away for that period of time revenue that would go to your school district or go to other um, entities that are relying on property tax um, to to uh, for their revenue, uh, whatever their revenues, you know, if it's that part of their revenue stream. Um, and you have to get permission and a vote from the school board to make something like that work. We have a couple TIFs uh, or one TIF in particular in the city that's a traditional TIF. Uh, but for these neighborhoods, we're going to use these 10 year 75% um, captures moving forward to help with housing development. Corey, if you'd go to the next slide just to kind of give you and ideas to where we're using one right now. Um, if where I've circled this on this map, you, that's an area that is um, is undeveloped. There's no road there. There's no water, sewer, storm, and we have a developer that's going to to build um, 42, basically kind of triplexes. But these are equity homes. These are equity bearing properties where the individuals will be able to purchase them for starting price point is $240,000. Um, and, um, but with the building of the road and the, all the other infrastructure for this to work, like I said, we will be capturing that increase as these units are sold, the revenue increases and be able to, to pass that back through to the developer to cover the, um, 
the the cost that they bore to build the the roadway to get into this particular cul-de-sac the walnut court that you see on the bottom of the screen that already exists um, and so we have the ability to tie into our water sewer and storm to make this work um, it's just that currently it doesn't exist but we see this as, as again being a real success story as they're being developed here in the city of Athens and in particular for our, our um, retiring population from the university and other um, city uh, businesses uh, to where they want to stay in place, um, but they don't necessarily want the, the larger home that they own, but they're looking for something to downsize into, which is another challenge that we see in our community. And I would assume a lot of other college towns are seeing that as well as where do those who are retiring, they want to live in your community, but they have they struggle with trying to find that smaller place to downsize into. So this is uh, something that we anticipate seeing a big success. Corey, back to you. Thanks, Mayor Patterson. So this was uh, fascinating. As a layperson, I, I have a lot of questions around NCAs and TIPS. Do those are those established by the city, or do you look for a developer to go off? Does it go to a, a city vote? Like if, as a university staff member, if I was interested in developing something like this with my city, what would be my first step as a university official? Yeah, well, again, establish a great relationship or a good relationship, working relationship with the, the local government, um, certainly with the mayor and the city council members. The new community authority did have many steps to where council had to vote on them as we went through the process. The same holds true for a, a TIF is that, you know, council has to, you know, be in agreement and vote. Um, I'm fortunate to where our city council, um, they're not blind to the fact that we're lacking in housing, affordable housing and whatnot. So it was not a difficult sell for the city council. Certainly wasn't for me. Uh, I, I do have the ability to veto and I would never veto something like this. <laughs> it's like, why would you cut off your nose to spite your face? Um, so, you know, this is, uh, so that's where I would start, Corey, to answer your questions. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, we have a couple of quick questions, and then we're gonna we're gonna move back to Jeanette. But in exchange for the TIF, what parameters did you set as far as price, accessibility, target audience, et cetera, if any? Yeah. The uh, the city. One of the things that we really contemplated is you you can adjust the percentage of capture. Um, you can make it less if you choose to in terms of of where you land um, with having something developed. It doesn't have to be 75%. You can, and you can also, um, quite honestly, you can work with your school district um, because I think a lot of times they're gonna feel like, well, we're losing revenue, but at the end of the day, the revenue gain when you've, even with this 25% that still goes to all the traditional recipients of the property tax, um, communicating to them that at the end of the day, you're going to see an increase, even in that 25% capture, because it's going from what was maybe getting an in, a property tax of um, a few hundred dollars, you know, maybe a thousand dollars annually that you're getting. Now, as it's developed, you're going to get, you know, significantly more, you know, 10 to 20 $30,000 as opposed to what you were getting for property tax in the past. And then in 10 years, you're going to be made, made whole to where it's 100% um, goes back to those that are recipients of that property tax uh, to include your school district. So again, there, there are levers we can pull, things we could can do. The other thing that we can do is we can make adjustments, like I said, to our water or sewer tap fees that we have as a city. Uh, so we were pretty intentional of knowing what levers we can pull and, and levers we can't. Perfect. Um, Mayor Patterson, there are a couple of more in the chat. I'm going to let you answer those offline, and we're going to move to our next part of this presentation. We do have an open Q&A coming, and I just want to recognize everyone that's here, and, and thank you for joining us. We have folks, again, from all around the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom joining us. This is an exciting conversation. We're going to move into our final part of the presentation, and then we'll go to some open Q&A from our participants. So back to you, Jeanette. 
Great. Um, so I have a series of five projects that I want to walk through as case studies um, with some solution examples that range in scale from an approach to unit design all the way up to conceptual master plans. Um, each of these projects has its own very in-depth design story, and I'm going to do my best to not get into the weeds with any of them um, specifically, but for our purposes, really focusing on what the aspect of innovation was. And, um, you know, obviously we can go into more detail in the Q&A if there's more questions. Um, so the first project that I want to talk about is the panoramic. Uh, this is an 11 story housing development located in uh, San Francisco's South of Market District. It's located in relatively close proximity to both the California College of Arts and the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Um, when this project opened in 2015, CCA had pre-leased uh, levels two through six for its students in the building, and then the upper floors were available to rent on the open market. Um, building amenities included actually just one parking space uh, for car share, um, because this is in a very transit rich area of the city. Um, there was lots of bike storage, there was a bike repair shop, uh, there was a roof level deck and a really nice um, lobby lounge with, uh, with a fireplace. Um, next slide. So the real innovation for this project was the development of, it was actually San Francisco's first 120 true micro units, meaning they were units that were less than 300 square feet. Um, this included a private bathroom and a kitchen and uh, potentially one or two sleeping areas. Um, the project team had to bank the case to San Francisco planning uh, around both the affordability of these units and the livability of these units. Um, the design used uh, millwork kind of creatively. Um, and they had the ability to transform designing spaces into sleeping spaces and there was lots of storage. And connecting back to the idea of providing a lot of diversity of choice, in addition to the 120 micro units, there were also 40 suites um, within the building that had the ability to also adapt between uh, three and four tenants, depending on whether you wanted to have a living room. <laughs> so there was some flexibility there in how to, um, how to make the units work for, for the tenants. Next slide. So this is a conceptual project. Um, it's called All Paths Lead to Oak Ridge. And this is really a study around alternative land use opportunities for surface parking lots, which we did talk a little bit about already. Um, and clearly this is an idea that can be applied to really any campus setting. Um, brick and mortar retail spaces were already declining before the pandemic, but the pandemic really accelerated the speed that uh, retail developers were coming to us and asking for um, studies in terms of land use opportunities, particularly at malls. Um, so our mixed use team has been involved in several very high level feasibility studies for those retail clients, um, reimagining some of the parking solutions. We still need parking um, and developing those existing surfing surface parking lots with housing. Uh, this particular example is the Westfield Oak Ridge Shopping Center in San Jose, California. Um, and the innovation for the design concept for this project really uh, started with looking at, there's a very intricate trail system uh, all throughout San Jose that goes around the site and potentially through the site. So we were really inspired to make this a really pedestrian oriented development. Next slide. So in the middle of this section, um, the team explored basically making a parking garage that essentially raised that pedestrian level experience above the garage um, in the section that's shown as the crest. Um, and it allowed some variation in the terrain instead of it all being a flat site um, to create an elevated, more private living experience in the heart of the site and shoppers could enter directly into the mall um, from the below grade parking lot. Next slide. Uh, this underground garage in conjunction with a few other on-site solutions created space for the development of over 1,400 units. Um, there, there's also a 12-story office tower, a hotel, and enough parking to not only still meet the requirements of the retail, but also to park the, uh, the residential and the office building 
um, while still maintaining that experience of a really pedestrian friendly development within the, the residential. Next slide. The Park Merced, uh, this is also in San Francisco. This is really a story about being very respectfully um, as we're reassessing a master plan that's not meeting uh, current density needs with the goal of really creating a vibrant neighborhood. Um, Park Merced is very close to San Francisco State University. It's just south of the university and was originally developed in the 1940s by MetLife. Um, and it had this vision of creating a suburb within the city that was really targeting returning servicemen and their families. Um, the development was characterized by garden apartments and uh, really wide vehicle boulevards. Um, then in the 1950s, San Francisco was experiencing a housing shortage and uh, MetLife added a series of high rise apartments that are still in pretty good condition today. Um, however, you know, the very car, car centric layout and the lack of retail and other community services really prevented this from feeling like a vibrant neighborhood, which we have all throughout San Francisco. Um, and so the buildings really started to suffer from neglect. Um, this led to a very robust community engagement process. I think uh, they're saying there was over 500 meetings with the community um, and really developing a revitalization plan um, of which phase one was actually approved in 2015. Next slide. So block 20, so within this uh, larger development, there are specific projects that were identified for phase one. And so block 20 was DLR Group's contribution to this redevelopment. Um, it has a 17 story high rise and an eight story mid rise with 266 units. Um, there is no direct connection between the Park Merced redevelopment and San Francisco State University, but the proximity of the university um, to this development really influenced the unit mix. And so the innovation on this project was the ability to offer student oriented micro units within a market rate development, um, really acknowledging the importance of integrating the student community into this new uh, vibrant development. Next slide. Uh, the last two projects that I want to share briefly are really focused on the ways that California state laws and policies have resulted in the ability to, to develop more density. And you know, as I touched on earlier, I know that these kinds of tools are not available in all parts of the country, but I did wanna talk about them so that we can start to share examples of, um, of policy that might be worth advocating for in your community. So the first one is Hub Berkeley. Uh, this is a student-oriented high-rise development located directly off the UC Ber Berkeley campus in California. Um, Hub is actually one of three high-rise projects being proposed in Berkeley currently. Um, Berkeley is really looking for opportunities for more student housing following a lawsuit against the university that was arguing that um, they were in violation of CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, due to increasing enrollment without uh, analyzing, properly analyzing the impacts on housing. Um, so the innovation of this project was using the California State Density Bonus Law to go from a 17 story high rise with 285 units to the tallest proposed building in Berkeley at 26 stories and 485 units. So it was an increase of 200 units. Um, the, date, the California density bonus law allows for developers to build beyond local zoning limits uh, based on providing a certain percentage of affordable units within the project. Um, and then beyond that increase in density, the law also allows for what they call incentives and waivers that allows the development to bypass other local requirements. Um, examples could be height limits or potential setbacks for the project. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is the last project I wanted to go through. This is actually a faculty housing project for the College of Marin. It's a very different scale from the project that we just looked at in Berkeley, but is kind of relying on uh, very similar systems in order to be able to increase the density. Um, so this is an off-campus faculty housing project that's actually just getting started again after waiting for the release, this is in Marin County in California, um, they just revised their housing elements. 
Um, so as we touched on earlier, California released a statewide housing plan in 2022 um, that laid out targets for new housing to be built all across the state and local municipalities were charged with revising their housing element to reflect their plan to meet those targets. Um, so the innovation for this project was actually through, taken, through action taken by the College of Marin. Um, they advocated with the planning department uh, to upzone this project site as part of uh, meeting those requirements um, for the statewide housing plan. And what this did was it essentially increased the allowable uh, FAR and height to result in an increase from five units allowed on this site to 20 units allowed. Um, the project was actually just presented to the Architectural Review Board last week and we're receiving lots of support for the design. So um, the next steps that we're going to be getting into with the college is looking at potential funding or uh, a P3 arrangement, kind of similar to what Ken described in order to get this built. So I'll turn it back to you, Corey. Awesome, thank you. I, a couple of, I just have two quick questions. Just I, I uh, as a university administrator, you in the first project you talked about in with the in San Francisco, you talked about the floors two through six were pre-leased and the rest were for what I presume non-students. There's a perceived notion out there that students and non-students living together in a high-rise complex is is not good. Our you know students might misbehave or there might be another issue with a non-student and how do we protect our students? Has that come to bear or is that something that was addressed through the community meetings? Because um, I'm, I'm again really interested in that, particularly here in Washington D.C., where um, housing is is a premium, and that could prove to be something very valuable. Yeah, I think that there there is a little bit of a stigma um, around really trying to integrate these different um, communities together, but I think that it's actually ha happening um, in our cities when we're not providing sufficient housing on campus. Students are living within our communities, and um, you know, I think that it really enriches the uh, the community itself. So uh, there were no issues that I was aware of, um, but I think really changing that mindset of needing to keep things separate and really looking how to uh, blend these together is something that's going to allow us to really take advantage of opportunities like this. So one of the gives hope for us uh, in the future. Yes. And then uh, as, as someone who leads community engagement processes, I was surprised to hear with Park Merced that there were over 500 meetings. Do you have a sense of how long that took to go through? Just because I, I mean, these things don't happen overnight. And I think that was a really valuable sort of hearing that I was like, wow, that's a, that's a lot. But do you have a sense of how long that was? Yeah, so I, my understanding is that those meetings started in 2006 and they got city approval in 2015. So uh, it's definitely a long process, um, but you know when you're really trying to make a meaningful change at this scale, uh, it is worth the investment of time. Awesome. All right, well, I'm gonna advance. I've got a couple of things I need to run through really quick and then we're gonna open this up. I'll stop sharing my screen, but I wanted to, uh, a couple of things. So uh, we have an upcoming housing survey that's going to happen. This is ITGA and the DLR group are working together to better understand the unique issues, challenges, and trends experienced by ITGA members related to housing affordability and housing insecurity for post-secondary institutions and their host communities. Uh, this town gown approach is important to holistically understand the variables at play, highlight the effective approaches, strategies, and tools, and position members to successfully address the foundational issues that hinder campus and community and constituent well-being. There will be two questionnaires. One questionnaire is going to focus on college and university needs for students, faculty, and staff housing. And I want to make sure that folks hear that. It's not just students, but also faculty and staff housing. And then there'll be a companion questionnaire that will focus on municipal and community perspectives around housing needs for permanent residents and those facing, facing housing uncertainty. The survey analysis and base data is going to be shared with our members so they can use the results as a resource for decision making. And the outcomes of the survey will be provide material for academic and professional research, white papers, articles, webinars, in the future conference presentations and opportunities for coordinated and ongoing engagement between cities and universities. Um, we anticipate launching these questionnaires before the end of November, so be on the lookout for those. And if you have questions about the project or would like to assist in that project, please email ITGA's executive director, Beth Bagwell at beth at itga.org. 
we'll get you connected there. And then uh, second, later today or tomorrow, you should receive a short six to seven question survey about today's webinar. Uh, we'd really appreciate a few more minutes of your time just to provide us some feedback. And we welcome all feedback. That includes both positive and constructive. Uh, learning together is what helps us all improve our communities. And we thank you in advance for your time. I would drop that link in the chat, but I don't have the ability to drop that to all participants. So we'll, that will be sent out following um, today's webinar. All right, I wanna move, I, the next part is questions and conversations. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna unshare my screen so that we can jump into a few of these here. And I would encourage folks to use the Q&A part um, and we'll get into it. Uh, let's see here. Well, I see Dr. Brown's answering this, this one here. Um, uh, Gail's got a question. Will the housing survey also include the cost of living in an area to assess if the housing is affordable? And I'm looking at Jeanette or Beth to be able to help answer that one. We're in the process of formulating those questions, and we are taking uh, part of the comments from uh, the uh, survey, uh, from the Q&A, and also the um, survey that we're asking you to complete. And now that we have this recorded, we will make sure that this goes to uh, the research team as we begin to formulate those questions. Thank you, Gail. Uh, this is a great question that just, that just popped in from an anonymous attendee here. Do you have any specific programs for faculty housing? And I know as someone who my prior institution was Georgetown, I work at American, we're in affluent neighborhoods, and oftentimes housing is not affordable for faculty members. Do any of you have any specific programs or have examples that you could point to for faculty housing? We, we don't have any specific programs, but the, the, the way we discussed it with the developer, you know, they're single, um, you know, dual bedrooms, and then there's some family occupancy units in the housing development. And so certainly we anticipated that some of those may very well be uh, units that meet faculty um, more family oriented kinds of needs. And so without specifically having a carve out for faculty, you know, we did anticipate that some units may very well be um, amenable to young faculty, um, you know, with family members to, to reside there. And that's a, that's a actually a really, really good question. I thinking in thinking about it now in retrospect, it may have been beneficial to actually um, maybe try to get some sort of carve out for faculty because um, again, faculty designated would certainly make it a, a viable recruiting tool when you're trying to recruit faculty. But you know, even without specifically um, saying that, the fact that we've got it in our geographical proximity and with what we believe is community-based affordability, hopefully it'll be attractive to faculty. Uh, Mayor Patterson or Jeanette, do you have any other thoughts on the faculty housing side? So we've been uh, talking a lot about, about that with our College of Marin client, and I know that there's a huge demand for it. I mean, the um, the location where they are in um, Marin County is one of the most expensive places to live in the country. And so, you know, being able to provide um, housing for the faculty, it's, it's interesting because it fits in a little bit of a gray area. So originally when we were looking at that project with them, we were trying to go down the road of potentially using uh, the state density program that I mentioned for the Berkeley project. And, um, Unfortunately, because of some complexities around uh, unions and, um, you know, while they're not quite meeting the affordability target, it, uh, living in, in Kempfield is not actually affordable for them. So it was a little bit of a gray area. And so I think that's some of the challenge that can come up with faculty housing is that, you know, there are uh, in incentives in place that can be used to help build that housing, but whether faculty is actually going to fit within that range um, is a question. And so uh, so finding other paths is, um, is where we are in terms of looking for funding. And I think P3 relationships and understanding how developers can benefit from 
that kind of development is um, is definitely something that we're looking into. I appreciate that answer. Okay, I'm going to ask a question, um, and AJ asked this question, and I and I appreciate this as someone who uh, has talked about his own history and the failures of creating a community engagement office and and what successes came from that. Has any institution actually failed in building new housing or commercial themselves? Um, and were there specific fears come from given the tax or borrowing advantages many institutions have? So I don't know if there's any examples out there. Of maybe there was a failure, but then led to a success. I don't have any examples. That's why, but I, I'm intrigued by the question myself. So AJ, I appreciate you asking it because um, we have to often talk about our failures to get to success. Dr. Brown, did you have a thought? No, we we haven't experienced any any failures, but um, you know, you know, part of the uh, the way I would respond to that question, you know, I think the fears from institutions, you know, any um, any divergence of of resources to anything other than the institutional mission, you know, the education and and training of students, you know, and so there there are lots of ventures out there that, um, you know, if I had the latitude for the university to say, hey, why don't we invest in this or why don't we build that or why don't we, you know, do that? Uh, we'd love to do those things. But the fact that, you know, the powers that be ultimately um, look at the university and all of the resources that the university has, whether they're philanthropic resources or whether they're state appropriated resources, and ask the fundamental question, is that really to the mission of, of what the institution is charged with the responsibility for? So I think the fear and apprehension comes from the perception, real or imagined, that there's some incremental deviation from the mission. Um, you know, when you want to make investments in, in other kinds of things, even though the yield may very well benefit the student and or faculty population, but I, th I think there's just some relative trepidation by by states and institutions to to make those kinds of investments. Um, I saw, saw you nod a little bit, Steve. Is is that a is that a fair is that a kind of a fair assessment? I, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, to add to this conversation a little bit, you know, in the the '60s, in the 1960s here in Athens we saw a, a large influx of the student population. It was growing, baby boomers, um, uh, you know, per, post World War II, you know, we were seeing a lot of growth. And so we saw a lot of development on campus. And then all of a sudden in the seventies, we saw a steep decline in student enrollments that posed a lot of challenges for the university to where they had to rethink, okay, what are we, what are we gonna do with this additional housing stock that we've built for the students? Um, and and so they they you know kind of went in a holding pattern, um, but they were bearing you know the cost and the maintenance of all those facilities. Um, as population student population started to grow, they quickly transitioned to a private. Uh, it was a, a you know a, a partnership with a, a private uh, uh, rental group, housing group, and they took it over. It's still this the university's land. Um, but the the housing they they put it, you know sent it off had someone else take care of the renting and and that's been fine and, and it's been effective. The thing I, I want to caution everybody is we're kind of looking forward in time, um, where we do see some development or redevelopment of housing on campuses. Um, is that you know what what what's the future going to look like when it comes to the population that will be continuing on in our school systems, you know, in our higher ed, um, you know, we've been seeing three great years of increased student enrollment um, here at Ohio University. Is that sustainable is the big question. Um, a lot of it's going to depend on marketing and branding of your universities, um, but who knows, you know, I think it's going to be more and more competitive to draw attract students. And so what's going to happen with the housing stock at that point in time, both on and off campus, you know, so it's, it's a real interesting waxing and waning issue that we're all seeing. Awesome. Uh, I know there's some extra comments here in the chat. We're probably not going to get to those because we're coming down on, on time here, but I did want to give uh, Dr. Brown and Jeanette any final 
quick thoughts you have on this. I know this is a continuing dialogue that all of us are facing around, um, not just the United States, but in Canada, the United Kingdom and abroad. Uh, any final thoughts? Well, well, just from a professional school perspective, you know, Memphis and, and creating housing for us, you know, we want um, our medical students and the people who matriculate here to stay in this community. You know, the research shows that about somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of professional students will stay um, or live where they train at last. And so when somebody graduates from medical school, they do a residency and sometimes a fellowship. And so they could be at, you know, Region 1, the Level 1 Trauma Center, Methodist, Lebanon Children's Hospital. Uh, after spending three or four years in medical school, doing a residency for another couple of years and then doing a, you know, a fellowship and, you know, cardiothoracic surgery for another five years after that. So for, for our population, them having housing, it's not the traditional pass through of an undergrad student kind of coming and leaving. We want that person vested in the community. So we see it as the long game for us you know, given those people residential capacity and a geographical proximity of where they're going to go to school and where they're probably going to work um, for, you know, some, anywhere between four and 10 years. So it's a it's a long game for us and a, a very much worthwhile um, endeavor, the way we went down it and the fact that the risk was de minimis to the, to the university. So, um, you know, I think the housing thing to to the point that Steve was making is a is a real real consideration that everybody should undertake but it's not just in the context of them being students you want to ground these people in your community and so the the best and the brightest people you don't want them just to come there and matriculate as an undergrad you want them to to live and experience life in that community and potentially you know, become part of that tax base in the in the long term. And so while we're thinking about housing, think about, you know, population growth and the fact that these people, some of them won't just be transient. You'll ground them in that community, you know, based on the uh, the amenities that you that you create for them. And so I would just encourage everybody to think about it in a much, much longer term uh, context than just the transient you know, student that comes there and lives there for a little while and moves on. Thank you for that. Jeanette, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, just I think coming from uh, from the design perspective on uh, on this challenge, for me, the, the thought that I keep coming back to is the idea that we really need to innovate and to do something different in order to get a different solution. And uh, Approaching that with a sense of adventure, you know, a little a spirit of um, of curiosity. I think all of those things are really important in order for us to break out of the mold of how we've been doing this and really understand what the opportunities are in each specific project ahead of us. Well, I just wanted to say a big thank you to our three panelists uh, for sharing your time and your talents with this with this crew today. Um, thanks to Beth Bagwell from ITGA for setting this up. Uh, if I mentioned this at the beginning, but I'll mention it again, this is being recorded. We will upload it to the itga.org website. Um, we'll follow up with a survey. And again, we would welcome any feedback, um, both positive and constructive, as we continue to, to think about this strategically and as a community of one, both city and university. Um, thank you for your time, and we'll see everyone on the next one. Thank you very much, Corey.